I just had the feeling today just to just to meet even for a few minutes to just to I know many have come from a long way and many of you were in, in Zimar also, no? And also Sanda Satsang you were here? And I just always feel that if you have you know come from a good way, I don't know how long you'll be here, then I, I just wanted to, to, to see you because I don't know how many people are still in the area, so it's it's, it's very nice to see there's so many of you are still here and uh, to have this chance to see you before you I met one or two today say I'm leaving tomorrow at the wall. And uh, even I've been here for, for a good few days, so I would not like it that if you left and I had never had the chance to you know, really see you up close or something. Very good. You have a question? Okay. We have, a, we have we have another microphone. Okay. It's quite burning. A question. It didn't dissolve itself. I was. Um, uh, the question is about awareness. So. Uh, I become sometimes confused about what awareness is, <laughs> because <laughs> uh, you cannot become confused without awareness. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's the point. Mm. For example, if I sit and if you just sleep, you said no. If I just sit and just it's sit. just nothing, like mm. no thoughts, nothing. Just just seeing, hearing. But if if I become aware of myself at this moment, mm -hmm. it's something appears like something mm -hmm. in this nothing. So it's the reality become disturbed. It's like it does not become disturbed. It's it's like you part think of the it mind. Disturbed? No, it's not disturbed. <laughs> the sense of the person is disturbed, but uh, the person is not the background. The person is not that pure background. Awareness is the background. Even background is not actually accurate, you know, to say that it is a background, because then is it not also foreground? So say it's only background, you know, this is the trouble with the words also, because all words have a limitation in them. Awareness does not it is not a concept. It is not an idea. It is not something that can be disturbed even. You know, we are like the fishes in the ocean discussing about, you know, where the water is or something. <laughs> if I can put it like this, you know, have you seen water? You know, have you really experienced it? Blah, 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 blah. You know, no, no, I've only heard about it, but I believe that we live in it, <laughs> and it is a source of our being, and it's always been here, and my very nature is water. Uh -huh. Nice philosophy. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's a little bit like that, <laughs> and all of it is just live in our minds. Only in the mind, which is our dreaming, you know, functioning, um, can we conceive of these things, believe them, and believe them into uh, existence or into our experience. And they become our experience on the strength of our belief in them. And so the obvious uh, is obviously missed. The, the fishes in the water discussing about, you know, whether water is a reality or whether it's our idea. It's a good uh, metaphor. It just came up like this also. <laughs> it's a good one, because um, from right here, how it sounds when, when we speak about these things, I think it feels a very, very apt, you know, sort of a metaphor or example. You see? We are thinking what awareness is, but our very thinking is arising in awareness. And even if you say, I don't believe in awareness, it is still just an idea saying, I don't believe in awareness, arising in awareness. Like space. Whatever you see, you see because of space also. And the sense of distance. You can perceive, you know. There must be some separation, there must be some distance, there must be some gap 
for you to perceive from the perspective of subject object. There must be some separation, some gap, some distance or something. Uh, the only distance that they can possibly be speaking about awareness is the distance of a thought that thought creates the illusion of separation and then we agree okay there is this separation and how to how to mm, how to end this separation and all this is thought is it but then the mind said but i mean okay you have to start somewhere i mean i you know how do i how do i get to It's like some some characters in a book whose life has come to the end in chapter four, just trying to say, I'd like to get into chapter five. <laughs> but can we do that without telling the author? The character in the book wants to is coming to the end and saying, oh, is finished life finished in chapter four? And he says, I don't want to leave the story. I want to be in chapter five and chapter six, but you know, can you help me to do it without the author knowing about it? And the character is saying, "Yeah, I think I know a way." And the author knows nothing about it. It's not possible, is it? Just amazingly shows up in chapter seven, you know? and the author said, "But I never write him this 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 character. I did not make it up." And the character in the book is going. It's not possible. We are dreaming all these things. But how to convey this when there's such a strong belief in our autonomy and personhood? And the autonomy, the personhood seems like it's the fact of our being and and not a fiction. It feels like this is a fact, you know. And right now, awareness is the fiction, basically. No, it wasn't from the person perspective. It's maybe, maybe I just didn't put. It's like alertness is there, kind of vigilance, but there is nothing to know because awareness uh, implies knowing something. No, I, I don't know. No, so knowing the, there is cannot, no knowingness thought. cannot be mm -hmm. attributed to awareness actually as an absolute example. Mm -hmm. No. Knowingness, you see, knowingness itself is known, is also perceived. Uh, it is not a pure function of awareness to know, because to know means other, means two. You see, and what can that which is totally perfect, infinite, all pervading, omnipresent, what could it want to know? What could be other than itself for it to want to know, or even admit to a separation? All of this can only appear inside its own dreaming. This is why the whole concept about dreaming came in, that because the reality is one, totally, total harmony, never two, hmm, that the only way it could achieve the sense of two-ness was to dream it, was to imagine it. Another way of another way of saying dream. <laughs> because it cannot actually do it. <laughs> it can only dream it as a marvelous, you know, expression of its power, that it had the power to create what we call Maya, the power to to, di to appear as diverse and still be only one. Including ourselves. We we, we are also Many creators inside this great game, because also in one in one body, somebody call you uncle, somebody call you father, somebody call you son, somebody calls you cousin, somebody calls you, you know, friend, somebody call you enemy, somebody call you employer, somebody call you employee, somebody call you idiot, somebody call you wise. And to each of these roles you respond completely, appropriately, without thinking about them. And yet, at the same time, you know you're none of them in your heart. You know, you know. I'm not these. What? What's a uncle? I mean, how did I become a uncle? <laughs> you see, like this. So something is playing all these parts and playing in them, but it knows it's not these parts. <laughs> 
I don't know if these examples are good enough. <laughs> Can I ask how many people have been like, are you totally new to this? Anybody here totally new to this? Oh, good. Let's speak in the microphone no, because then others can hear you and I. I was I was just thinking the, you know, we listen to you to your instructions very clearly, and you talk about uh, the self not having any qualities, no shape and no color. So then uh, we at least myself go looking for shapeless shape, <laughs> for <laughs> colorless yeah, color. Yeah, is a trouble you see. You know, it's uh, and also the act of looking by its nature is automatically outward. You know. Mm, yes, by habit. You know, so. By habit. Yeah, because uh, some people, from from young age, they are, they, their habit is to look inward. They're very much in touch with their feelings, and and even you know, knowing that the feelings are not stable, they they can be like that. Necessarily, these these dualities, these conflicts, they, they will come. It's like if I put a shelf and I tell you on the wall, and then tell you don't put anything on it. You you just you want to put some. They they go together. Why make a shelf if you don't put anything on it? <laughs> so what I mean by this is we talk about something, and then you say, okay, look, you know, there are no such things as con- there's no concepts. But the very saying that there is no concept itself is a concept. You can't get out of it. <laughs> and you want so, to describe it. Uh, but we do. You don't. Mostly, I can describe what it is not. You see, actually, perhaps the most pure way of sharing this is in total silence. But you have to be mature to communicate in silence. You see, if I just say another word about this, because yes, get get ready, um, that you know, in silence is the purest way, in a way of communicating this. But you have to be receptive, uh, sensitive enough, you see, because our training says no. Our way of communicating is with words, but we are we are communicating multidimensionally. Sometimes involuntarily, you are communicating. Your body language, your vibration, is communicating all the time, not just to human beings. You see. It's just our favorite one is talking. We think that's how we transfer and integrate and communicate is through the verbal things, you know. But we have so many levels on which we are communicating, you see. And even if you are not trained in that, you may meet a being one day who said nothing to you and your life changed. This is this is how I feel with you in your presence. <laughs> <laughs> I only I the words don't they don't express it. I just this is the only way. Yes. And it's truthful also because our words are just symbols. We are, as I said earlier today, we are very intuitive beings. We are sensing life, but we are so much trained now to use the mind and to rely on the mind to, to, to understand things and in, in its own sometimes awkward way, and especially the mind functioning on behalf of the sense of personhood, even more contaminated than this, as a way of, of understanding each other and meeting and knowing and like this, and uh, but on an energetic level, we are responding to each other all the time. 
how you may meet someone and like them without having a conversation or something. This morning I was given an example. There are some blind people, physical blindness, no? who can meet you very profoundly and know you through your vibration, through your your feel, without seeing. Seeing, we 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 treasure seeing so much because we feel that without it, that it is the great introducer to the world. But there are beings who can sense uh, sense your presence and sense your your inner quality and light, you know. But they're not able to see you physically. Even without touching you, without touching your body, they 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 ah oh, very good, thank you, and they can relate. We are not able to do that because we are um, somehow spoilt by using our minds as as the chief means and tool of of knowing the world, so to speak. And the other senses are less. Acute, maybe they are. They are acute in their own way, but rely on them less. I mean, if you had to do without one of your senses, hmm, of the five that we hear about, you know, and you were given a choice, which one would you lose? I don't think it would be sight for many people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, my love. I leave everything at your feet, Guruji. Mm -hmm. That is a very great thing for a human being to do if you can alleviate yourself of the burden of personal responsibility and the sense the the overrated um, sense of autonomy. Highly overrated. And begin to like to walk blind is to really see. I don't know if anyone would appreciate some such things. Meaning not, not to not to work out ahead your steps in the same way like you're walking and you're walking and you know to get from here to there and you don't have to watching your feet as you go. But if you had to, if you were not able to see, you would have to develop your sensitivity very quickly. How to somehow correspond with with other beings and the life and even the air around you. I saw recently one report, a film about one. There are a few people like this, but one very amazing one was one man blind, completely blind, but he rides his bicycle through the city. <laughs> Whoa! He can't be blind. Totally blind, physically, and he's able to just by and seeing where the reflection come back, he knows where he is. He can feel. He can feel how close he is to some object. But riding a bicycle. <laughs> Everything is so much so much is more possible than we imagine. You know about a musician, there was a documentary about a musician. Um, also a musician who can't hear and yet she played the most exquisite music and she's <coughs> deaf? No, deaf. Yes. Always deaf? Yes. She was born that way. So she listens by vibration, then, on some level. <coughs> Hello. 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 <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is a subject that is really resonating at this moment. So I okay. feel like uh, 
this is that the feeling that my eyes are covered and that my hand is hold like a mother or a father and I'm just following. Say again. That that my eyes are like covered for my idea and that my hand is hold like a child is with the mother or the father and that I have no idea where I'm going to. But I have so, 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 so much faith. Yes. yes. So much faith. Yes. Like a child with a mother. Yes. Fortunate to you. Yeah. <laughs> In my eyes. That's sometimes so difficult. Huh? But I, and then I say, yeah, just trust, just trust. And it unfolds so, so, so beautifully. So be- Faith is greater in the beginning than in the end. In the end, it's just the most natural thing for you. But in the beginning, it is miraculous that you have to walk millimeter by millimeter and and come fully in the in the in the sunshine of your existence. That every moment, grace smiles upon you, and then you notice it. Then this is miraculous. When you don't notice it, it's not miraculous anymore. All our life is miraculous, but because you become too familiar with it, you, the miracle falls away, <laughs> isn't it? And some people are experiencing now for the first time what you have experienced thousands of times, and for them it's totally miraculous. Someone receiving sight after 20, 20 25 years of being blind, and uh, there are programs now where doctors are travelling around the world and doing simple operations of removing cataracts and so on from people who have been experiencing blindness for 20 years and so on, and, and just w- watching them see for the first time. Is there a greater miracle than that in experience you are seeing? Your mother, your father for the first your children, your face for the first time. I mean, what's going on there? Hmm? Is that? And you look at your face and say, like, ah. <laughs> Not a miracle anymore. A miracle is only a miracle in the appreciation of it, in the seeing of it. And so sometimes we have to lose things in order to find your value again. If your life was always full of beautiful things, you would have no appreciation. You have to taste pain and the sense of separateness and grief and uh, a loss and all these things help us to grow internally and to just just see your own life again with fresh eyes. Maybe one day you come to see with the eyes of God. Wait a little. <clears throat> so, strong feeling to stepping out of my life. Yes, yes. And I really don't know what's going on, kind of, and not thinking about that. Yes. Because you told me, look now, yes. just not to get involved yes. with what I'm seeing. Yes. Wow. Yes. <laughs> it's kind of. Yes. Yes. Because sometimes the mind is just kind of polluted. The things, the things are not polluted, but the way of seeing them become polluted. The mind, in its psychological expression, can become like that. It makes everything dirty, you know? and your world shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until you find yourself standing on one square foot of earth. Nowhere to touch. Everything you've made dirty. Even this is a blessing, because it can only shrink into. A new chapter. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm just, even in the worst minutes, I'm like, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you, because with Guruji, like, mm. like we have, it's impossible to be weak. Yeah. Like you get in. Yes. Stronger. I, yes, yes, yes. It's impossible to be weak. Because everything, wise wisdom means whatever situation, whatever circumstances come for you, you're constantly growing, you're expanding in, in consciousness with everything bitter and sweet. 
Blessed is that life that begins to see like that. Then nothing will overwhelm you. But to be overwhelmed it has its place. You may have to taste being totally helpless for a bit, to taste what it feels like, to be totally helpless, nothing, nothing you can do. You have no more moves left. You run, you run out of moves. The only thing left to do is just to vanish. <laughs> Maybe your greatest move, <laughs> but you don't know how to do it. And my husband and my sister, I'm so sorry, I have to tell, they send in all their love to you because they cannot be here in physical presence. They love you, love you, love you, we love you. <laughs> I don't know. Ah. So, so. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. It's so good. Uh -huh. Speaking of being there. Uh. I I'm going to take a taxi in a few minutes. Oh. And I want to thank you very much for everything. <laughs> okay. It's been such a wonderful time, the best of my life. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you helped me to heal all the wounds. Uh, all the wounds. Uh, I can sense myself uh, different. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, very wonderful to wake up and don't think about nothing. Just it's very good. <laughs> stretch and oh. and wow, no worries. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And uh, thank you to he to help me to take me with your hand and yes. reveal the very core of a mystery. Very good. good. I love you with all my heart. Ah, I love you too. And it's, yes. Can I come? Yes. Yes. Our life has to be a little bit mystical, no? You can't be so explainable. I mean, you have to be pretty boring to be explainable. You have to even surprise yourself. <laughs> you should not be too predictable. And then the day is just so beautiful, so open. Mm? Yet there is one thing I want to say as well too, is that don't tie yourself to any mood, even the best mood. You see, if it's because it's only it's only a passing, no? also. Hmm? You say, oh, I'm feeling so great, You're so fantastic. Thank you. I say, yes, yes, it's, it will pass. <laughs> it will also pass. Huh? But don't be more better be in that place that observes the beautiful and the ugly passing. Don't cling to anything. Just be in that neutrality. You see? Can you in the neutrality taste the most exquisite, the most bliss? Of course. Of course. But not as an addict. No? Everything comes then. Because then your mind has attained a certain evenness, an equilibrium that is not rooted in, in personhood. That is so beautiful. That which does not fade. Anything that comes in the mind as some phenomenon, some object of feeling or some thought or something, it will come and go. It is just clouds passing. Enjoy, it is fine. Some sadness comes, also you, you experience. But don't use it as a way of evaluating what you are. You know, you are not that. You are not the passing cloud. You witness the passing cloud. You are not the passing cloud. Mm. Can I uh, ask something? Yes. Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, so there is a, for example, nice feeling coming, and I am the one who sees it. And I can enjoy it, no? So myself. Mm -hmm. In the opposite case, mm, what I just like be in 
in my center and what I do, like uh, like by not a good feeling, for example. Yeah. Um, I just stay and then, like, not looking. Well, we have a beautiful way of yeah. guiding you through that because you say uh, uh, an unpleasant feeling come. You can begin to use it because many people they just what I say they go cold turkey, meaning they just sit it out until it passes, or you go to the movie to try and distract your mind, which works for a little bit, but not uh, it's not a good way. A strong feeling come, very heavy feeling is coming. And then I say use this feeling also, learn something from it. You see. Is it? Does it come with a message? Does it come because it has a story? Do you know what? It, why it is there, or is it just that you feel energetically just really strong feeling? You can look at these two things, ways. One is that it comes and you know what it's about. Is because your best friend told you a lie, and you made a big mistake out of it, and you feel very sad. You know, it has something. You can begin there, or it's just a feeling. Maybe start with a bit of boredom, don't know what to do, and then something just like you know, why is life like this? And, you, and then you grow it. You you develop the feeling into some bad thing state, and then you you're in this. And, you know, these things will matter how you read it. You know, because if it is just a feeling <coughs> inside, then you can understand that your mind is interpreting the feeling. The feeling may come just by itself. It's just what it is. But then what happens, a tendency from the mind or from the past is to keep interpreting the feeling in very negative ways. Personally, that's the worst. It starts to think this something the life is doing something against you personally, in the form of people or whatever it is. And if it can hook you and pull you up into a person, then it's already beating you. If you are experiencing life personally, then you're already you're already at a disadvantage, because it is the only way that what we call the serpent's voice or something, the dark mind, can get you, is that when you become personal. You see? Because whenever you find that you are molested by some, you are dreaming. You're in the dream somehow. Or the devil, a demon, something. What if the minute you you know that it's a it can only appear in a dream. It cannot be real. It cannot come in any real way. When I mean dream, what I mean is that dreaming here. What I mean is that you are not sitting in your truth. You don't as yet know your true place. You are living life as though you are just your conditioning, and you are infinitely bigger than that, more than that. So that's one way the feelings come. It's very strong, and then you see a whole habit, which is to, is to misinterpret it or to interpret it in a very negative way, and then you bring the clouds in onto yourself like that. Then you say, "How can I get out of that?" But in a sense, the habit is too old, it's too stale to get out of it, because like a reflex, it's like playing the thing over and over again, or it may be a new kind of thing, a new incident has happened, and then it brings in a sense of some. Strong pains. If it's there, also you can feel it. Both of them you can feel. Just feel them, without adding interpretation or becoming personal. Try and just see them as though you're looking at someone else's feelings. It's very difficult because we are used to you read your own and you you already copyright it. You already label it as your own, but it's there and it's happening. I say if you just let it work its way out, like in the body, and something wants to be personal, but there's a space always here that is not directly involved. It is not participating in this scenario. It is just a space. And then when I say to you, stay neutral, don't invest any energy, and let the feeling work itself out. It will exhaust itself soon. But many people, because of habit, they find it very difficult to follow this advice, because as soon as it comes, well, they are up fighting, or they are taking it on personally. And you can see that they become so much of a person, in it. The feelings they come also for a wise person, a sage even, it may come. It cannot grow because it doesn't have the soil of the attention, the identity or the belief. They are not interested in it. So these forces they weaken because they need you to connect. You see? So it's like you put uh, you put on your computer and the screen flashes up and then you know you say don't log on. 
<laughs> if you log in, you're in, and then you have to you're in the game. Can you not log in? You see, and something is there at first, and even this, uh, even this is something you can perceive. You're even earlier than this, even more pure, even than your first reaction. Um, <clears throat> for me, it was always uh, very clear to know that I am not my feelings, because I feel it, and I e can even localize the. It feels like there's a point in the body, no, where you can feel the the feeling. Yes. And then, but then you feel in it, and then you feel like okay. It's, just there, and then sometimes you feel also it goes, no, like mm. outside of the whatever aura energy field or so. And uh, so for me, is if I have a, a strong feeling in, in something or let's say emotion, so it's possible to locate it in the body mm. somewhere. So, mm. will it, will it also be the same for thought that you recognize a thought is just another? Thing seeming to suggest something, or you know, calling you into play, or something. Would you see like this also? Uh, if it's the same for me with the with the thought. Yeah. Um, mm. Sometimes the the thought is creating a feeling. Yes. Yes. Develops into feeling. Ah. Mm. I always go to the place. That was there before these things come. And there's no story there. There's no incident, there's no event, nothing is there. So when these play come, I know they are just shadows, they are just the play. And over a bit of time, a little bit of exercise, a little bit of practice, you just come to see that but it's nothing. It is just it becomes really even ridiculous, ridiculously nothing. But with belief, you can make even the most silly thing torture you. So this this ability to observe without without identifying so quickly with that reflex, that is already good. It brings back space. And I think perhaps one of the great modern sicknesses is the sense of the lack of inner space. The people's life become too claustrophobic. There's too many things to do. There's so much things going on. And they have not found their center, so it's 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 a very claustrophobic thing, and something is fighting for some fresh air and not getting it. You see, we have to taste that too for a while, but you shouldn't have to be tasting that all your life. You can come out of it because all beings are compelled somehow to evolve. We just evolve at different rates. If you can be pointed towards where the end is, what is this, the significant thing to find out quickly, early, and then you save the rest of your life from misery <laughs> and any future ones you would probably incline to have. You save them early. <laughs> you see? Then, if you just keep going along with the same humdrum thing, something just. Uh, See, you once you discover the point I'm making, you see, you are just thinking, I don't believe it's so simple. No, how can it be so simple? It's so simple. Didn't somebody say? Some some people say, you know, it's too good to be true. Then somebody told me this time, it's too good to be not true. It's too good to be untrue. They say it's too good to be true. Someone told me, no, it is too good to be not true. It has to be true. Yes. You are leaving now to Ireland, to Shannon. Uh, give my love to the Shannonites. <laughs> okay, darling, thank you. Oh, darling, oh, you are going in the same car? Yes, I did. Okay, okay. This is from Amita. Okay. Ah, the same, same. Good love, big love for everybody. Okay. Thank you. Come and stay here. Let's take a quick picture.
Hi, Dolly. Lovely to meet you. Thank you, same, same, same. Um, I don't really know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I um, have come from England uh, and um, it's my first time meeting you yeah. and um, yeah. it's my first time meeting you um, and I only recently found your um, teachings yeah. and um, since being here I've just such a space has opened up inside of me um, and it just feels, I mean, sometimes it's beyond words and it's, I mean, it's so special here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't really think I have any questions, really. Yeah, it's good, it's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm always learning and it's great to, yes. to have met you and to share this with everybody here. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Muji. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's uh, really amazing. Uh, people are often posing such nice questions and, uh, well, the inner guru, the Satguru speaks to the faces of... Uh, my uh, fellow faces of God, but uh, to my surprise, I actually happened to, to find a question in, in Zimmer. Uh, we were talking quite a lot about um, the mind, how it works, and uh, about consciousness. And when I was walking uh, back to the lodge, I saw the feeling came well, whom is he actually talking to? Because uh, well, there's the mind, there's the consciousness. Uh, uh, you cannot command mind, uh, and uh, it won't obey, and you cannot tell anything to consciousness what to do. Um, so who are you talking to? Yeah. Uh, is it now a koan where there's no answer to? And sometimes I feel like, yes, it's like uh, the qu questions like, what is the clapping of one hand? Uh, so, uh, it is much simpler than that. It's not a koan in that way. It's not much simpler than that. And it's good that you ask, because you give me opportunity to, to, to say. Because, uh, you know, there are many people who speak these things, a kind of, a sort of very clinical advisor about these things. There's only consciousness, and there's like this, and uh, the mind does not exist. So who is speaking or what, you know, like this? No? I'll tell you who, who is speaking, who is speaking to also. The consciousness, somehow, in order to manifest itself, first it needs a body in order to, to enjoy or taste experiencing. And with the body, some identification with the body comes. The consciousness is not actually the body, but it functions inside the body. And uh, when it somehow identifies with the body or paints a portrait of itself as a person, which means that I am the body, belief came to it, and there's no one who was born who never thought that they were the body at some point. Okay, when the consciousness <coughs> embodies itself in a, this form or any form, it tends to identify with that form, and in the belief I am this form, and then subsequent to that, whatever conditioning, such as I'm I'm a woman, I'm a man, what based upon the form, and also whatever kind of conditioning came in through cultural conditioning or environmental conditioning or whatever religious conditioning also becomes, it's necessary in some way for the consciousness to identify with some structure, with some, with the body, then it can begin to build a sense of a, of a life on it, of a, of a sense of personhood, a sense of identity with it. And it has to taste this identity. So that's of what, is, it, that's what, when the consciousness comes into that, um, you may say, um, identification with itself as a person, it loses its pure. It's, it's, it doesn't lose it, but it gets hidden in a way. That purity uh, that is there and still is there, and it gets substituted somehow with like an overlay of this identity of being a person and so on. And the consciousness then goes through life in a sense, with a sense of autonomy, like I make the life that I, I have and I create and I do what I want to do. and. And, and these ideas grow more intensely inside the consciousness, but it loses its way. 
at some point. And mm. I call it a good fortune when it begins to search, because for a while it takes on a kind of arrogance of feeling, well, you know, I, you know, I don't need anything from you or you. I do what I want and so on. And um, but at some point, it uh, it becomes open to receive guidance and to even be open to receive guidance is a, is itself an, a state of evolution of evolving to a state where it needs to it 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 uh, it seeks help even yes uh, that I do understand yes. and I experience it was myself that uh, my question comes from the other viewpoint and maybe if it's a little bit over conceptual and maybe it makes up a, a wrong a duality between uh, mind and and consciousness. Um, it's just who am I you talking to then? Of course, if consciousness wants to experience, if this uh, divine lila happens to to unfold, mm -hmm. and uh, it gets lost a little bit as a part of the game and uh, wants to to uh, uh, play hide and seek and wants to be found again and find itself again. Um, okay. Uh, but whom are you talking to then? Um, so you cannot talk to the mind, which is uh, no, because the consciousness, the opponent. <laughs> so no, the, the mind is actually not the opponent. When consciousness somehow so. plays as a person, you know, or takes itself to be a person, then also mind is an aspect of that consciousness, comes descends with that that person idea, to act out as a friend and enemy at the same time. And it will yes. it's very much needed, in fact, yes, for a yes, while yes, for yes. this game to be played. That consciousness will sometimes, in a state of uh, what you may call hypnosis and believing that it is its own projection, it will sometimes go with the mind's projection and accept them. And sometimes, when it gets uh, frustrated with that, it will search for answers somewhere else. And finally, it will collapse, yes. But uh, are you talking, if you give us advice, are you speaking with the mind? Oh, I'm uh, speaking with you. <laughs> so with huh? with, a, with a true one in behind, but that consciousness. No, no, you, no. You're making it look very complicated. Actually, <laughs> I think it's more simple. So I don't know what you intend by this question. If you genuinely don't understand it, or you're trying to test me. Oh no, that's not testing. It's. Uh, yeah. um, I just was asking myself, whom are you talking to? Yes, and uh, it is. Um, well, I can drop the question. I can can. No, uh, but you must drop it authentically. Don't drop it because you know. No, but if it's yeah, something yes. feels sincere yes, yes. for you, you can carry on and we'll. And talk. and it feels well to do so. This is mm. what uh, I I did with it uh, uh, till now. But when I'm a satsang, satsang, as I think most people can understand, uh, having this mic is a little bit the focus point, and uh, many people uh, have make the same experience uh, to be in this pendulum between. Yes, it works. We made it uh, actually. Uh, uh, and the, <laughs> your example, um, uh, mind says oh, we made it, <laughs> and you need to step back. Ooh, who's talking there? And the other point, uh, um, end of the pendulum. Oh, we'll never do it. I'm, I will never make it. And so I'm in the pendulum, as many people are. And uh, of course, there's this little hope that uh, uh, taking up some microphone mic uh, might help us to get a little bit out of this pendulum. Because, well, we can call it this main cremation place, maybe, where the mic is. Um, that's why I'm taking up the, mind, uh, the mic and, uh, <laughs> and, and see what happens. Yeah, we, you were talking so much about uh, how things, uh, if we go back from, from Zima or from here in the world, and it makes a change. So it's a little bit like this divine domino play. Is it called in English uh, in domino again, where the stones, one stone hits the other? And so it's a multi-directional domino. And even if we are not fully enlightened, so we go home and make I the think difference. You do so I hope a lot it, uh, it helps. To simplify yourself a little, because uh, it's only important to communicate as clear as you can what you want to find out. Because uh, don't try to explain too much about this and what's happening with other people, because you really don't know. You can only know what's going on with you. And if you speak, if you say you want clarity about something, mm -hmm. then start with yourself, because then that will feel most authentic. You cannot just we can speculate about others, but you don't you don't really know. You know only from your experience, not. and you can find a lot 
just through your experience. If you, you can say things look like this, but I want to bring it back to how it feels here and so on. That would be more easily understood, because I am not really catching your point. You, know? <laughs> you seem to be asking me, who am I speaking to? Yeah, it's a theoretical I, I, question. I, I felt that I answered it. You can, if I say to you, consciousness is speaking with itself. If I say, as I do sometimes, that there's really no real dialogue; it is all one monologue, mm. and that actually is consciousness when it diversifies itself into the sense of I and otherness, then it's speaking to the sense of otherness. But when it is truly aware of itself, it knows that that otherness is not other than itself. You know? Would that mean something to you? Yes. Oh, well, I can understand it, yes. Mm. And feel it, yes. <laughs> mm. Well, still it's not a I question, but maybe that it can't be answered. So it's, uh, it's an answer as well. Uh, which I get. Maybe indirectly. you think too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you are too much a thinker. Because oh, that's right. In, in, no, in, in what really works is when something is genuinely, even if you are confused by something, you can say, I'm confused by this and really I'd like some clarity. And we start to talk. And something in your energy you know, helps somehow to clarify, even if it's a bit of a muddle. And uh, somehow grace enters into that exchange, and something comes clear out of it. I don't see why any interaction should not end in that type of clarity. Hmm. Sometimes it doesn't, for various reasons. You know? And uh, in the end, I have to leave it and say, OK, well, whatever, whatever that is, that, that's, that's that. <coughs> but uh, I would prefer to, to speak in a way, because I'm not here to, you know, in some way, just exchange, you know, um, ideologies or something like that. Really, uh, my own interest in this is that is to see the beings are coming home again to their original uh, <coughs> self by clearing up some misunderstanding. Not by uh, because there are many people who have a feeling that they've got the understanding and look, look, look. But when they speak and when they they seem to share things. It's all muddled up and over sophisticated or something in this way. And I think, you know, I would not encourage anybody to go down this road. Impressing people is not it. If you can really genuinely uh, converse with someone, it should come, the end of this conversation it should end really in a silence. I'm not saying, oh, you know, we're trying to make silence. No. But if it's genuine, it should come to a place of silence and a place of space and love and appreciation, actually. It doesn't have to, but in the most intelligent and open and sincere exchanges, they often come like that. And also, energetically, also, this is something that I think perhaps you would be good to find that, that energetically, is what really matters in the end, that somehow you hit the right frequency in your conversation. And if you are being clever, or being too sophisticated, or being too complex, it just does not communicate. Maybe with some people that may, it's a game we play also, but here it's not anything here. Not anything here. You can know the whole thing about the whole world, and still you are not free, you are not wake up. You can also be totally illiterate and be totally awake. So just, uh, if you can, you know, avoid complex. Um, if you are in a state where you are confused, then your, your talk might appear to be complex. But generally, it would just, compare, it would just convey a kind of confusion. When a talk becomes complex, it's usually because people think too much. They've read too many books, and they've not understood. And then they believe that they've understood. And then when you try to convey, it just has this very... It has no life in it, you see? And we are living beings. Your words should be alive also, come from a place that is you know, alive. Even if you're confused and you're searching, that's life. 
because you're searching for space, for openness, for truth, for a resolution. It has to come across like that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure how I wear this absolute. You're not quite sure what? I'm not quite sure when I'm like in this absolute awareness kind of state. Mm. Mm, because Usually I was uh, always uh, making it fixed like on the way I perceive the world because mm. sometimes I see myself in everybody uh, like now and it's like really tangible like mm. I really see myself and sometimes it's more like <coughs> that the perceiving of the world is like it's a dream and I'm like also in the body walking in the dream And then now a third type came in where I'm like, where everything is kind of an illusion and my body is walking in it, but I'm not in the body. And then there's like sometimes in satsang where it's just like <laughs> empty, um, but the perceiving is normal, like in the personal mode, but there's nothing in, in the head. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, how do I know which one is true? And <laughs> then I... Um, I was thinking about that and then I saw a satsang where you said that all the types of perceivings should be um, kept open the same way like the concepts we used to talk about it should be like flexible but then how do I know? Actually, we, how you know is that these questions won't be there <laughs> and these kind of interests would not be there the mind, self, all these these categories will not be there. This mind and consciousness and absolute and all these things will not be there. Everything is completely come to stillness. And it doesn't fluctuate. It's not like that on Monday and Tuesdays, but Wednesdays change. It will always be the same. You can speak from different uh, levels, <coughs> as is appropriate to the needs of the moment when you encounter beings, without even knowing beforehand, or no, no practice, just in the immediacy of meeting, something strikes an accord, it strikes uh, some, the right level, and they communicate, because it's not coming from the person, not coming from the person's experience, you see, the so-called person, the so-called person's experience, it's not coming from there. This is why uh, you would be totally empty of any kind of carrying around any knowledge or the feeling that you have any knowledge at all. You're just like a space inside, and out of the space, whatever is needed in the moment, whatever is appropriate to the moment, manifests spontaneously. And it satisfies the needs of that moment. When it has exhausted its expression, it goes back again into complete emptiness. But the emptiness did not, did not weaken or grow bigger. It is. It, it's immeasurable. You see, and such is the natural state, and it's a natural state for everyone. Hmm? But what happens is that a lot of importance has been given to our culture, and the belief in ourselves that we are these tangible entities, and that that is a fact, and uh, you know, there appear to be a continuity to our sense of self, but that continuity is not really about the person. The continuity is really about the sense of presence. It is more enduring, more consistent than the effects appearing in it. And the person is really a very unstable expression of consciousness. It's always fluctuating. It is really buffeted by moods and so many different things are contributing to the way in which you experience things. That's the nature of the person. The real step in spiritual evolution is the shift that takes place from person to the state of presence. Person to presence. Person is a very, um, you may say, um, a very fickle entity, unstable. We make promises we cannot keep. We imagine things, but they are far less. 
or whatever it is. It's a very unstable. And you see this much more clearly in this type of environment. The mind is not you may be in a city, you don't know that you what it what influence you're living under from your mind. Because it's so integrated. But when you come into an environment like this, then the mind starts to it's like bursting like popcorn. You just see how look it just seems so silly. You say, Wow, you know, that you're carrying all these thoughts and they come up like this and of course it feels sometimes very turbulent for, for some beings and they because they give so much importance to the mind. You imagine your mind to be deeply valuable for yourself and so on. And then it feels really disappointing that this is going then what it does, it just starts to blame the environment. Look at these people and these bloody compass toilets. I mean what and then it's gone. It will go. So those who stay, they must go through something where they endure a bit of this, but they know underneath this, intuitively they know that they are in a state of auspiciousness. And so they overlook the little nonsenses the mind brings up to kind of throw you off track. And they stay with it until gradually something begins to stabilise, and as they stabilise more, then the real perfume begins to come through. The perfume of silence and stillness and the sense of that, that spontaneity and this lightness of being, and this, these start to come. This is the more true perfume that comes from this flower of pure consciousness, but the flower no one can find. You see? And gradually you stay in that environment, you're, you're, you begin to appreciate it and to love it. And the more you love it, the less you are of you. As a separate entity, one day you will search, who really am I? And nothing will be found there. And in the absence of that finding or expected finding, in your in your in your not being there, that will be replaced by a supreme sense of presence and openness and lightness. Nothing in this world can give you that as a fragrance or a taste. That taste can only come from inside you. You're kissed from inside. You see. So how do I know when? So on. Uh, when you are not there, you will know. Hmm? It will replace you, the one who wants to know. And uh, that will be the greatest replacement. Paradoxically, the less you find of you, the more you find of you. <laughs> the less you find of the whole regime of thinking and the whole habits, you know, is disappearing. The more you are, you are more true as you, not as person, but as a pure consciousness. And I don't want to speak about this in a kind of futuristic tone, because even as we speak, if it resonates in your heart, it is already taking place. I would not say to someone, look, if you follow this for the next three months, I am not telling you this. Why? Because I am totally, totally, I don't even want to say sure. Because it's not a belief. You see, I don't know what the word is to say. Maybe I'm sure, or I know that you are this. Just the 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 habit and the, the stickiness of the habit uh, is thinning away. The more you are in the presence, the more you are enjoying or even not enjoying, even struggling, and then feeling. Some people speak about this intensity of the oscillation, when the, when the attention swings into the heart, and how we feel totally blessed and so so happy and complete, and all so so full of joy and gratitude and singing. And when it swings out again into the mind and the world, you know, oh my God, no, no, please, no. When is this going to stop? And oh my God, and. 
please, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. <laughs> we do everything, and it swings back in, and oh, hallelujah, everything is great, and oh, no, yummy, ring, whatever. And and this, and but still, beyond even this oscillation, you are, you are not the one oscillating. You see, and you do come to that, but in a natural, in an organic way, not as an intellectual conviction. And this is where it is rooted out. All ego is rooted out, because if even a tendril of ego is left, it will begin to create new shoots, and they will disturb your peace. Not necessarily, but why not take him out? Let him go out. You can never be sure. And don't say, "Look, I took him all out." <laughs> if you walk around and you say, "You look, you know, <laughs> I finish him. He's finished." I took his last breath. In your very saying, he survives. <laughs> okay, so don't get cocky about it. Just quietly keep looking and seeing, whatever it is that is arising, or whatever it is that rises up in any sort of personal fragrance. In fact, you begin to know to to, to recognize when you're being personal. The ego cannot smell its own breath. You see, but the one who is wise actually. They begin to smell that breath of this one. They see, oh, again, look, my mind, mind is coming. And after this, after a certain while, even this thing, it's not worth giving any attention to this. It's not worthy of even attention. You know that is the biggest slap in the ego's face when its voice becomes insignificant for you. When it says, oh, "I'm gonna smash you." <laughs> you just laugh. So what the hell was that about? You know? oh, then he explodes and vanish. The greatest victory of that to overcome this is when these thoughts, these voice from ego, has no appeal at all to you, has no significance for you. Yes, because you have fallen so much in love with your inmost being. That you know, you have no, you have no space for the ex-boyfriend. No, he's gone, he's finished. You have found a beloved. You have found a beloved. Why are you talking about you? Would... Oh gosh, I tell you, <laughs> why will you go there? Sometime in a moment when you are feeling a bit bored, this 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 feeling comes, and you give it space. You may find yourself drifting off into some region or something. But uh, I don't know for how long you, you. When you go back to any place that you should not be, in your being, you start to feel a nausea. You feel so bad, and that's great because you have found your your inner Zen stick. <laughs> when you go there, whack! <laughs> it feels ten times worse than it used to before. In the ignorant state, you make a mistake and. Uh, uh, when you do in your conscious state, and you go to some you, this silliness play with the identities there, it just feels ten times worse. You don't make the same mistake over again, you see. And it's a wonderful thing, because you evolve so so fast and like the, the speed of light. You are going. There's no nothing there for you. You are no more powerful than when you are single-minded. We are so accustomed to be double-minded, two-faced, you know, going in two different directions at the same time, that that's where our strength is reduced, in fact, because you're hemorrhaging energy just by being indecisive, or not that you have to decide. You see. You see, if you are, if you are, always. Uh, m- in the middle of many decisions to make, is a state of confusion. If you are not, it is not that you make a new decision, it is just you are resting in your natural state. One time I was asked you know, about where in London I have lived, and a thought came in, and I started to just go through. I started to remember all the different places I have lived in London. No? It was something like forty-three, or something like this. Now I want to tell you something. Why I say this, because 
each time I moved was completely natural time to move. <laughs> it was completely right time to move. It was not a restlessness. It was just that's when I had to move. Because of that, uh, my time in London feels completely seamless, like no trouble at all. Because it wasn't because of a fight. It wasn't because of the split up. It wasn't because I couldn't pay my rent. It wasn't because of any of these things. It was just time to move. And because of that, it doesn't register in the mind, or, oh, I was always moving about in London. I felt it was very stable <laughs> <laughs> until I started counting. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Same thing with you. If you are sitting in the right place, all these histories and mysteries of your mind just stuff. What was that? Didn't happen. You have no time for it. You're not here to advertise your man, your mind's bad behaviors and whatever. It's just uh, did that really happen? You don't know what was dream or not. It just you're not really interested. You're not interested in in having a life. You are life. And in the instant, life as it unfolds hmm, is appearing in you, and you are the witness of it, but not with any deep interest. Everything feels much more light, more playful. What becomes profound is your peace feels profound. Your inner joy feels very profound. Your storyless joy your storyless happiness, your, your unreasonable bliss, <laughs> your unexpecting, unexpected joy. <laughs> this is what comes. Your unstudied wisdom. All of this is coming. All beautiful qualities manifest spontaneously in the awakened mind. You don't go to university to study for this. You go to the universe, <laughs> not university. <laughs> and you don't have to be preparing for life. What's the next move? And prepare. No, because a beautiful trust enters your heart. You may feel you're not a very Trusty, trusty, but trust come. Trust come. Mm. Yes, because you have found life. When you find the life, the true life, then your prayer might be, "I don't, don't ever let me leave this place." You may say like this, you know. Because sometimes we we doubt a little bit, you know. A wind comes, and you, if you are the ego, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot stop your mind. It's like trying to stop your mind when you are the ego. It's like I say, trying to trying to stop the wind dressed as a kite. <laughs> you understand? You try, <laughs> you're gone. <laughs> okay. But when you are in your own heart, the wind come. Why you find wind? Let him flow. <laughs> thank you. Nice, nice. Oh, uh, thank you. I'm very happy. Because I was going to go and do something else, and I said, no, I, I want to see them today. <laughs> and now I thank you for allowing that we meet each other a bit, no? <coughs> that feels good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. I would love to spend some time just in silence with you. Uh, my dear. You're always in silence. <laughs> Whatever we are doing, if there is noise, it is only on the surface, and you cannot uh, 
stay on the surface and uh, not experience the ripples. You see, yeah, that that deep silence which is in you, and uh, this is the beautiful place. One moment, I think they're bringing something to mm-hmm. say. Just wanted to say thank you for mm, how much you give over and over again. You know, we have mm-hmm. satsang coming up on Sunday, but you're here with us, sitting down, um, and being in this space. I didn't know how busy you are. <laughs> Every day you you're doing something, you're working on something, putting this sacred space in order. And so the fact that you sit down so much with us in a very uh, I want to say personal, but that's not. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. I understand. What you mean. <laughs> in a very like. Um, in a very approachable way, you know. When I, when I'm um, encountered your spirit um, years ago, I think 2012, um, through YouTube, you know, you were like this sacred, illuminated being, and you still are. But in, I think there was an image or perception I had yes. of how you would be in person. Yes, yes. and it would be super difficult to approach you and um, there'd be like 80 different people around you in some kind of symbolic formation that I <laughs> you know one time <laughs> one time actually you know it's funny because <laughs> when, when I first went to and it was the first time I went to the United States they invited us to, oh, yes yes I think we was going I went to New York I said New York and they met. No, no. Where was, where was it? Um, no, no. It was California. One time, I went to California. We came off, and I came out of the airport, and uh, they. Uh, <laughs> 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 the, the people waiting for me was very shocked, you know, how I came out like this, no? Because what happened was there had been some correspondence happening between them and somebody who was. Was also it, uh, speaking on my behalf, so I thought, no. And uh, they were asking many things, and this one from this side was saying many, many things. You know how he likes things and stuff like that. Because <laughs> all I said was, I started by saying, you know, for me, I don't mind. All that's important for me is I can only sleep on cotton sheets. I can't sleep on any sort of polyester, not like that, because. There will be sparks in the night. I don't know what will happen. <laughs> a cotton sheet, a glass of water, no, maybe a firmish kind of bed, a window, no, like this, just so some air can come in, and I could be in a, I could be in a cardboard box. I'm fine. I'm just fine. Okay. Well, when it hit the the internet, it was like the most amazing. Details and what kind of flowers I like, and so I don't even know what flowers I like. It was amazing when we arrived there. They were saying, "No, this is amazing. I was amazed to see you like this, because we thought you were going to step out like the Matrix or something." Right? <laughs> All sort of uh, uh, so <laughs> they were very happily surprised. So, but you're so relaxed and you're so easy. I said, "Yeah. Why? What? What have you heard?" I said, oh, look, we will read it to you in the cars and all the things. So, and many people also, they only see me in a chair. They think I live in a wheelchair or something <laughs> all day. Because <laughs> always I'm sitting down talking like this. So you come now. You have to tell them he does move. He is like <laughs> in a buggy. Okay. <laughs> But we move around, and I'm involved with many of the projects that I have I beautifully uh, enjoyed. It, but uh, so 
Yes, yes, it is good that people come here. No? And then they say, Oh my gosh, you had a different picture like you expressed at first. And then you come, you see it's, it's different. <laughs> Maybe one day you come and it will be matrix, you know. <laughs> I'll just give you a red blue pill or a blue pill. You know? <laughs> As a matter of fact, if I can say something, one time this is true, you know. One friend in London, you know, she told me, you know, one time. She came into the house and she said, "Oh, you know, Guruji, there is this. You know, I've got to tell. There's a film out actually, that really, really, really is expressing from Hollywood what you're teaching. You know." I said, "Really?" She said, "Yeah. You must come. I want you to come to my house. I'm going to watch it. Get the sangha around to the house. We want to watch it." We went to the house. You know, went to her house. She had everything. Popcorn, everything ready for this thing. I'm saying, what is this? Because whenever people tell me things like this, I just know it's a big, big letdown. <laughs> and we got there to see which is this film from Hollywood that is a satsang film. It's really amazing, right? Mirabai, you know what the film was? Huh? The Matrix. I was so disappointed. You know? Not with the Matrix, with her. I said, "How could you think what I am speaking is about the Matrix? What have you been doing with my teaching?" <laughs> so people's perception is very different. No, so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. So good. <laughs> Also, what I wanted to say, I had so many questions, and now I somehow, um, by just being here and slowly but in a secure way following your pointings, mm. I feel so much more stable. And yeah. I used to have a flying mind, yeah. and now it's more and more. And I'm so thankful to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and I just didn't need to tell it to you. Yeah, it's very good. Thank you, thank you, thank it's you. It's very good. We actually imagine we have a lot of questions. Yeah. You know? It, it comes to mind, you know, like there are so many questions, so many questions. But when you actually arrive, you can't think of any questions. <laughs> like because actually as you come into your heart, your heart has no question. Is <laughs> it mind has a lot of questions as you're coming and experiencing your heart. You know? oh, wait, I don't have any questions. Like, I want to ask you this, but this is really silly. <laughs> okay, I'll take this other one, this one. No, that's just ridiculous. How could I? And these are questions I've been carrying around for a long time, but in the actuality of that moment of being here, it is not there because your consciousness, your mind is in a higher altitude than usual time. And so the mind cannot molest you in this place because you're in your sacredness. You see, this is it. Now it's even funny to watch it. Just yes, watch yes. it and le learn how to not yes. go into it. Yeah. It's very good. Thank you so much. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank good, good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Ah. Thank you so much. Ah, yeah. okay. So grateful to be to be so close to you. I've yeah. seen you in. Uh, in London, and it was so far away always on this big yeah, stage, yeah. and it feels so. Just thank you so much for the your stage love. is like that, of course, because yeah, of you know course. it's difficult for people at the back to see, and you know then I feel like I'm up there on my own. <laughs> <laughs> but they say, "Oh, look, he's all the way up there." I say, "I'd rather be down there," you know. I feel so joyful in Monte Sahara. It's so amazing, really. Yes, yeah. It's like my heart is overflowing. That's very good. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you very, very much. Good. Very good. And to where are you going? Huh? I'm going. I'm going to Berlin. Out to Berlin. I've been there some years ago. I liked really? it there. Oh yes. Where? Oh. <laughs> Mahadev, where? where are you? Where is Mahadev? Mahadev is here. Mahadev. He was living in Berlin, and I go to stay with him. We had satsangs in Berlin. So come back. <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah. <laughs> but he's not there now. But uh, you are there, no? Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I went to my the only ever operation I've ever had in my life happened in Berlin. And on the second to last day of satsang, no? I was in satsang, I started to feel pain. But this is pain, pain. Oh. When we came out and going home, we stopped at one pharmacy. The pharmacy tell us go to hospital. <laughs> I was in the car. We went to hospital. Went there. Then I said I had a very bad appendix, and uh, I had to cancel that. Cancel our trip to uh, Barcelona. I was in hospital in Berlin for you know maybe one week. It was great. <laughs> it was very strange. <laughs> it was very strange, very strange place. <laughs> After I had my operation, it was very strange. You know, you remember these things. I mean, when they were bringing me to the room in the heli- in the elevator with um, on the stretcher, they were all everybody laughing. They were all laughing, laughing. They're in this. Uh, all, myself also been pain, laughing, laughing, laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and then one man, one one one, when I I was woke up and then I was in you know very in the pain, and one the nurse she was a big lady, she came you know, and she just uh, I see her with a needle and stuff. She walked over to my to where I'm, my bed. She lift up my thing and go <laughs> and pull it out. I was looking at her. <laughs> So I said to her, "Good morning," <laughs> and she was. So what kind of place is this? <laughs> and then in the afternoon, and I'm telling you, this is the truth. In the afternoon, then I saw. I saw in the afternoon, I saw one man. He also was there doing something. He had his back to me, and then he turned around something, and he had a bandage on his head. <laughs> And then he had the needle, and then he came over, and he was like this. And I'm saying, he looks like a patient. <laughs> and he came, and he was. I said, no, no. And then he, and then he, he came, with a funny smile. I said, what kind of place is this? <laughs> and then the first time I had to, I had to come out. I had to go to the bathroom, you know, for a wee, you know. And I'm walking very slowly, slowly, slowly. And then out of the room comes one man in a wheelchair, old man, okay, and he's covered in blood. All his shirt and stuff is covered in blood. And he came out. He's going, "Good morning, good morning." <laughs> uh, this is so. <laughs> I said, "What sort of place is this?" Maybe it's, <laughs> Maybe it's a mental asylum. <laughs> Crazy. But after this time. The most wonderful time. Looking, looking out the window, there was a there was a river, a little river, no? I started looking at it. I said, I'm so happy. I said, very good. Only if bad feeling. I was so sorry that I disappointed people in Berlin, in uh, Barcelona. That's the only reason. But I had good time in this place. <laughs> the beautiful song in Berlin. In the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good, good. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. 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 You are going to eat more? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, my love. Thank you. So good, so good, so good. Can I leave my person? I am leaving my person. Okay, I have a good place for person. person. I have a good place for person. Thank you. Oh, I don't put it on. It's not okay. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>